My story begins when I was a freshman in college. I started college earlier than most people do. I had just turned 17 and it was my first time moving away from home, so I suppose I was still a bit naive to the world. I was much more trusting and didn't catch on to red flags the way I do now. About a month into classes, I met a guy named Luke at some random party. He was 26, unemployed, and I later found out he didn't even go to my university. He'd just been crashing on the couch of one of his friends who did. He would basically just spend his time going to parties, getting drunk, doing drugs and hanging out with college kids, who were mostly all in their teens. In my 17-year-old mind, nothing was off about this. I know, I was an idiot. I only saw him as the cool older guy who was able to buy us alcohol, which he did all the time. I thought he was really attractive and so did my friends, so I was pretty pleased with myself when he asked for my number at the party that night. We went on many dates over the next few months, and before I knew it, I was this 26-year-old man's 17-year-old girlfriend. He would get angry that I didn't want to tell my parents about him, but I knew they wouldn't approve and would try to put a stop to it immediately. To be honest, I never fully saw what Luke and I had as a serious relationship, so I didn't see myself ever introducing him to my family anyway. I still had a lot I wanted to do. Graduate, travel, live abroad for a year, etc. And I guess I always assumed we'd break up when I was ready to do those things. Plus, he wasn't really the let's get married and start a family kind of guy. Rather the let's party and have fun until we get tired of each other kind of guy. Well, after eight months of dating, I guess I still wasn't tired of him because we ended up moving in together. Everything was going okay, aside from the fact that he was still unemployed, leaving me to pick up a full-time job on top of school in order to pay all the bills. He did make some money on the side, which I always suspected came from drug dealing, but any time I asked, he would just dismiss the idea and tell me his mum was helping him out. I didn't press, because if he was making the money from dealing drugs, I would rather be oblivious to it anyway. As I stated earlier, I'm an idiot. Even with all of Luke's obvious flaws and shortcomings, nothing had actually made me scared of him until this one night in December. A lot of our friends lived in the same apartment complex as us, so almost every weekend we would just pop over to one of their places for some drinks. We would both get a little drunk, Luke would occasionally do some drugs, and then we would just go home without incident. This one night, however, Luke had had way too much to drink. I mean more than I'd ever seen him drink since knowing him. I'd lost track of him at one point, and when I went to look for him, I found him snorting a line of coke with some random guy in a dimly lit back room. It's important to note that his drug use had started to become heavier and more frequent by this time, so the sight actually pissed me off a little bit. I just left the room and went back to mingling with my friends as I didn't have the energy to confront him about it. A few minutes later, the particular friend I was chatting to at that moment stopped me mid-sentence and told me to look to my right, and what I saw still sends chills down my spine to this day. Luke was staring daggers at me with his fists clenched, and the look in his eyes was pure hatred. He stormed over to me and proceeded to call me a whore in front of everyone. It was kind of like those movies when someone yells something at a party, the music stops, the room goes silent, and everyone is staring at you. I remember being so utterly lost for words that I couldn't even say anything back. He continued screaming at me in front of everyone, saying someone told him I was flirting with one of his friends and continuously calling me derogatory names. I became so embarrassed that I stood up and literally ran out of the front door, as I didn't know what else to do. I could hear Luke chasing after me, and when he caught up, he grabbed my arm so hard that it immediately bruised. I broke away from his grasp and ran towards our apartment, all the while he was yelling at me with that evil, hateful look in his eye. When I got to our front door, I had just enough time to open it and slam it shut before he caught up with me again. However, since I didn't lock it quickly enough, he managed to push it open a little bit before I stopped it with my foot. Pure adrenaline allowed me to push it back closed and lock it before he could enter. When I began to calm down a bit, I felt my foot getting hot. I looked down and saw that the door had completely taken off a layer of skin from the, from the top of my foot. I had been wearing flip-flops and I guess with all the excitement I hadn't even realised I'd hurt myself. The sight of all the blood prompted me to break down in a hysterical fit of tears. I felt scared, shocked and completely alone. Luke must have slept at one of our friend's apartments that night, because I didn't see him again until two days later. 
He showed up at our front door with flowers, apologising for that night and telling me that he'd simply gotten too drunk. He said it would never happen again, so I stupidly let him back in and told him I'd forgiven him. In my heart, I knew I hadn't really forgiven Luke, but I tried to convince myself that I did for the sake of our apartment lease. I was now a little bit scared of him, but we'd signed a one-year lease and were only on the second month. I was worried that having a broken lease on my history would make it hard for me to rent in the future. It seems stupid to put something as trivial as a lease in front of my safety when I look back at it now, but at the time I didn't realise how dangerous he was. I just convinced myself that I could somehow peacefully ride out the next ten months and make my break when the time came. Stupid, right? I know. After weeks of me just trying to make the best of a bad situation, I think Luke became aware that my feelings for him had changed. He suddenly became unreasonably mean, jealous and angry. One night I went out with my friends after class without telling him. I was doing this a lot as I liked to be away from the apartment as much as I possibly could. When I checked my phone around 8pm, I saw he'd called me 22 times. I called him back and he demanded to know where I was. After listening to him yell at me for five minutes, I gave him the address of the bar so he could just pick me up and take me home. At least if I agreed to go home, the yelling would stop. I knew it was just easier to give him what he wanted in order to keep the peace. I waited outside the bar for him for about ten minutes, and when he arrived I was surprised to see three men hop out of the car with him. All of them were holding bats, including Luke, and one of the men was even wearing brass knuckles. Luke grabbed me by the arm and dragged me into the bar where he began screaming for the guy who was fucking his girlfriend to show his face. He looked at me with that evil glare and muttered through his teeth that he knew there had to be a reason I was out instead of at home with him and demanded I point out the guy I was cheating on him with. I started crying out of sheer terror and a few of my male classmates sprang up and ran to my aid. When Luke saw the two men begin to run up, he let go of me and a huge brawl broke out. Luke and the men he came with managed to beat up one of my classmates pretty badly before the police were called and I still hold so much guilt about that to this day. Words cannot explain how sorry I am for involving other people in my fucked up relationship. Even though everyone was comforting me and telling me it wasn't my fault, I will always feel like it was. Nothing can ever make me think otherwise. Luke was arrested and wasn't released until a week later. Apparently he'd had a warrant out for unpaid parking tickets. That week gave me the perfect amount of time to pack up all my things and quickly move in with a girl from one of my classes who I'd gotten pretty close with. Fortunately for me, the leasing office at the complex Luke and I lived in was technically on school grounds, which meant they had different rules and standards from a traditional apartment complex. When I went to plead with them, they granted me special permission to break our lease. After I explained my situation, they didn't want a violent man, one who was now criminally charged with assault, living on their property, and they sure didn't want me living with him either. Luke was served with the eviction notice the day he got out of jail, and that same day he found out where I was staying. Even now, I have no clue how he found the address to my classmate's place, but it's none of those things that still makes me sick when I think about it. I didn't tell that many people where I was staying, and the ones I told knew the danger I was in, so I don't believe they would have given up my location. The night he got out of jail, I was sleeping in my classmate's spare bedroom, when around 1am, a loud banging woke me up. I groggily went into the living room where my friend was already standing, looking through the peephole of her front door. My heart sank when I saw her whisper, I think it's Luke. She was now ducking behind the door, motioning for me to get out of the view of the window, but I was too furious to listen. I went right up to the window and started screaming at him to go away. I was yelling profanities at him, flipping him off and threatening to call the cops. I had had enough and I was more furious than scared at this point. I should have listened to my friend though, because before I could react, Luke raised his arm and arched it back as if he were about to throw something at me. I heard a loud explosion and felt dozens of tiny shards of glass fly into my face. I fell backwards onto the floor as my roommate began to scream loudly. I hadn't realised it immediately, but Luke had thrown a brick through the living room window and it had shattered all over my face. I remember seeing Luke run away out of the corner of my eye and I remember the police showing up, but I don't remember much else after that. Aside from a handful of cuts on my face, I was fine physically. I think it was more so the mental damage that really did a number on me. That following week I wrote my friend a cheque for the damages to her window, 
withdrew from my school and moved back home to my parents' house. Everything had gotten far too real for me to handle on my own, and I was genuinely terrified that Luke had it in him to kill me if he got angry enough. I also mostly just didn't want to include anyone else in my bullshit anymore, and I thought it better to disappear completely in order to protect myself and the people around me. I immediately confessed everything to my parents and told them how scared I was. Even though they were extremely disappointed in me, they helped me get back on my feet and enroll in a community college a few minutes away from their house. I pretty much got on with my life over the next year and a half, working, going to school and spending time with my friends. I dated here and there but never found anyone I liked enough to commit to. It was good, uneventful, simple life for a little while there. Now this is the truly terrifying part. Over time my brain lessened the severity of everything that Luke did to me. Slowly I somehow convinced myself that I'd overreacted about the whole thing. I completely forgot the feelings of terror, helplessness and pain Luke had brought upon me. Time had made me forgot. Couples fight, right? We weren't even together that long, and he never truly hurt me, right? It wasn't that bad. This rationale is probably the culprit behind what I did next. Nearly two years after I'd last seen him, Luke called me from a random number out of the blue one day. I was surprised to hear his voice and thought about hanging up, but the curiosity of wanting to know what he wanted kept me from doing so. He told me he went to rehab and that he was sober now. He told me he was making amends to everyone he'd ever hurt in his life and that I was on the top of his list. He asked if I wanted to get together for a coffee so he could properly apologise. I told him I'd think about it and he said that would be fine. Two weeks later I found myself driving to my old college town to have coffee with Luke. I came to the conclusion that closure would be good for not only him but for me too. There were a lot of things I realised I wanted to say to him. I wanted to tell him how he'd hurt me, how many times he'd embarrassed me and how I felt he'd taken advantage of me. I wanted to tell him that a 26-year-old had no business dating a 17-year-old in the first place and that I see how wrong the whole thing was now. When I eventually pulled up to the coffee place, he suggested, I saw him standing outside waiting. The first thing I noticed was that it did indeed look like he had gotten sober. He was in much better shape and he was dressed quite nicely, and he looked very put together and well kept. When I got out of the car, he gave me a hug and thanked me for taking the time to meet up with him. I was surprised when he offered to pay for our coffees as that was not the Luke I remembered, but I gladly accepted. At first it was a little awkward, but we slowly got into the swing of things, as if we hadn't been estranged for the last two years. And as I stated earlier, the brain is a powerful thing. Looking at him and seeing how well he was doing made me forget all the bad things even more than I'd already forgotten. He looked so good and was being so pleasant that I never even got to tell him all the things I'd planned to. We were enjoying our reunion so much that I stupidly agreed to go back to his place to continue it, and I will be 100% honest with you guys. I agreed to go back to his place with one intention, and that intention being sex. It had been a while since I had been intimate with a guy, so I guess in a way I was craving it. Luke was a familiar face, and a familiar body, and seeing that he was normal now made me feel like it wasn't the worst idea in the world. I was caught up in the moment, and I really don't have any excuse for my poor choice. I was wrong, I was stupid, and I never should have put myself in that position with a man I knew had violent tendencies. So we did go back to his place, and we did have sex. It was fine, nothing crazy happened, and the next morning I woke up around 8am, ready to drive home. As Luke walked me to my car and gave me a hug goodbye, he whispered, Don't die, bitch into my ear. I remember laughing it off and trying to act like I didn't have this giant chill radiating throughout my whole body. He smiled and walked away as I got into my car, wondering why the fuck he'd just said that to me. Fair warning, the story is about to get a little bit graphic. About 30 minutes into my car ride, I started to feel a slight ache in my pelvic region. By the time I made it to my parents' house, the ache had grown into excruciating pain. It literally felt like someone was holding a match up to my vagina while simultaneously cutting it with a knife. When I got out of my car, I looked at my seat and saw that it was covered in blood. I looked down at my pants and saw that they were covered in blood as well, and it took me a couple of moments to realise that the blood was coming from my vagina. 
I wasn't on my period, and the pain I was experiencing made it obvious that something was very, very wrong. I felt like I was about to faint, so I texted my mum to come outside since I didn't think I'd even be able to make it to the front door. When she came out and saw me keeled over in my car seat and pants all bloody, she immediately told me to get into the car. She helped me to the passenger seat and drove me to the emergency room in record time. She was trying to get me to explain what had happened on the way, but I was in far too much pain to talk. On top of that, I did not want to tell her I'd gone to see Luke, because her and my dad would never forgive me. To this day, they still don't know that I went to see him. The doctor did a couple of tests on me and came to the conclusion that I had a very serious urinary tract infection. He asked me in front of my mum if I'd been wearing tight pants or had recently had sex. I denied that I'd recently had sex but told him I wear tight pants all of the time, to which he replied that must have been the cause and to start wearing loose pants. He gave me some antibiotics, told me to refrain from drinking and eating certain things for a few weeks and sent my mother and I on our merry way. I'd never had a UTI before that day, but they were about to become a frequent occurrence in my life. Ever since that day, up until I was about 27, I had about 30 to 35 UTIs a year. And no, that is unfortunately not an exaggeration. I had to completely cut out caffeine and alcohol and switch to only drinking water for years, as one sip of soda or coffee would bring on that light and knife feeling I had described earlier. My UTI started to rule my life, and it was very hard for me to hold a job because I could never tell when one was going to plague me. It was also extremely hard for me to date because having sex now felt like someone was rubbing sandpaper throughout my vaginal walls. Sometimes I would find myself too broke to go to the doctor that I would just let the UTIs go, leading them to turn into kidney infections. It was all just as strenuous on my finances as it was my health. I went to dozens of doctors, and the only explanation I ever got was that some women are just more prone to UTIs than others. I got many STD tests and any kind of test you could possibly think of, but everything always came back normal. I eventually gave up trying to find out what was causing the UTIs, and just dealt with it. I began to know my body and could usually prevent the UTIs before they got to the excruciating point. If I had sex or a beverage with a lot of caffeine and felt one coming on, I would stop everything I was doing to drink as much water as my body could handle. It would take a couple of hours, but the pain would go away and I could continue on with my day. I also took to the water method because I was beginning to worry about the disgusting amounts of antibiotics I was taking. Not only that, but they were beginning not to work anyway. I always knew immediately that Luke was responsible for my health issues, but shame and embarrassment forced me to keep it to myself for the longest time. That night that Luke and I had had sex, he told me he was going to get some lube. He told me I was dry, even though I didn't really feel like I was, but I let him do it anyway. He came back a few moments later and the condom was covered in what I thought to be lube, but now I know it was something else. Not only did it not feel like lube, but it dried me up almost instantly. I don't know what it was, but I know he intentionally put something on there that was incredibly toxic to my body. I don't have proof, but the don't die bitch comment is really all the proof I need. Did he not think it was going to hurt me as badly as it did? I don't know. Did he think it was going to kill me? I don't want to know. I am almost 30 now and I'm happy to report that I only get about one UTI a year, if that. I don't remember exactly when the UTI stopped, but one day they just did. I finally feel like a normal functioning human again. I also, eventually, graduated college, though it took me six years due to the breaks I had to because of my health issues, and a few years ago I managed to secure the job of my dreams. I changed my number the week after my last encounter with Luke, moved states a couple of times, and have not spoken or heard from him in almost ten years. Even though things are better now, I obviously have a lot of regrets. I regret not being honest with the doctor that day so he could have done some tests and found out what the substance Luke put on the condom was. If I was honest with the people in my life, maybe we could have gotten to the bottom of it and charged him with something. I regret meeting up with him that last time, but all I can say was that I was young and dumb. I definitely learned my lesson, and I'm now the most cautious person you will probably ever come across. For anyone reading this, especially women, always believe someone when they show you who they are. It took me a long time to realise that I put myself through a potentially deadly situation, and I am ashamed that I could have ever been so stupid. 
I still have a lot of self-deprecating moments where I tell myself I deserved everything I went through because I allowed it to happen, but the truth is that no one deserved to be physically harmed. I knew I was making bad choices, and I wasn't blind to all of the red flags Luke was showing, but I am only human at the end of the day. We all make mistakes. Take care of yourselves, everyone. There is this hotel at the Bulgarian seaside, in which we have an apartment. To be honest, that's a strong word for it, because it's just a big room with a giant bed, refrigerator, big windows on both of the walls, and a small bathroom. It's on a grand floor, and again, both of the walls are facing the parking lot of the hotel. Despite all of that though, it's perfect for me alone. It's right next to the beach, and that's why I've been spending some of my summer vacations there. So it was three years ago in July, and I was spending a week in the apartment with my now ex-boyfriend, and three to four weeks after that, I'd be alone there. My ex had always said that the owners of the hotel were a bunch of creeps. Whenever we went out of the room, we had to walk along a path passing through the reception, where the staff would sit all day doing nothing. The dad, who was maybe 60, his son, Crum, who looked around 40, his daughter around 45, and her husband. When you pass them, they'd all go silent and stare at you. Every freaking time. I was used to it at this point, but my boyfriend back then would get really irritated, especially when he caught Crum staring at my ass and smiling. After that, he used to stare him down, right in the eye, whenever he got a chance. So my ex left to go back to the city. It's now the third week and I've been alone. The nights are really hot there, so I'd open both windows wide open and close the curtains as to not let anyone see inside. After all, I'm at ground level, and my bed is directly below both of the windows. Later in the middle of the night, I woke up and I felt like someone was watching me. This happened the next few nights. I'm easily scared and paranoid, but I was alone there, so I've been telling myself to chill, and that it's just my crazy mind trying to scare me. A few nights went by without incident. Meanwhile, Crum tried to talk to me two or three times when I was leaving to go to the beach. It's now later that night, around 1am. I'm falling asleep and I hear footsteps outside on the path. It isn't strange for me to be hearing this, as there are some people staying in the apartment next to mine, so maybe someone is arriving back, or just going out. But, the footsteps suddenly stop at a certain point, really close outside. I can hear it clearly because of the open windows. I'm sitting in the bed now, tentatively listening, when I notice that my door handle is moving slowly up and down. I was losing my shit at this point but I stayed quiet and gave myself some nice job girl for locking the door. After that, nothing happened and the person just walked away. I frantically closed the windows, called my dad and told him what had happened. He told me to lock and close everything and that he'll come and get me in the morning. It's a five hour drive. This was three years ago. Last night, we're having dinner and my dad said, do you remember your sea adventures? He then proceeds to tell me that he'd made his own little investigation back in the day and asked the owners of the hotel for security camera footage from that night. They checked the ones covering the parking lot and saw a male figure walking around. The part with the door handle wasn't in the camera's range though. My dad remembers my strange midnight waking up routine and tells them to check older records. When they did, they saw a man standing at my window and peeking through the curtains and being like that for 15 to 20 minutes. The woman finally recognised her brother and told my dad he had mental disabilities and begged him to not press charges and that they'll take better care of him. My dad, being the good guy that he is, didn't press charges and was selling that apartment. Anyone interested in buying it? So strange and awkward crumb. Let's not meet. One night late, about 1.30am, I had left my boyfriend's house after a night of watching TV. My boyfriend lived in Birmingham, and I lived in a neighbouring area about 20 miles away, so I had to go on the motorway to get home. It was a lonely drive late at night, and I'm not a confident driver, so it wasn't something that I looked forward to. I had done this drive three times a week for at least a year though, so it wasn't unusual for me. I'd crank up the late night talk show on the radio, and the time would pass quickly and uneventfully. 
especially at that time of night when the roads were virtually empty. I pulled out of my boyfriend's estate, and yes, I admit it, I mistimed the turn and accidentally cut a black Porsche up with tinted windows who was travelling about 50 miles an hour. The Porsche had to brake and get into the next lane quickly to avoid a collision. I remember shouting, shit, as I knew it was my fault and hoped the driver wouldn't make an issue out of it. I was wrong. We were in adjacent lanes waiting for the lights to change, and suddenly his interior light came on. In the car was a young Asian male, aged about 25 years old. It immediately struck me that this guy was expensive looking. He was head to toe in designer gear and had a gold watch on that glinted in the car light. He had a woman sitting next to him in the passenger seat, who I presumed to be his girlfriend or perhaps sister. She was also Asian, but her presentation was what alarmed me. She was also immaculately dressed, but had the most frightened look on her face I have ever seen. She was cringing, her chin was virtually in her chest and she was shaking. She looked up for a split second, we stared at each other. I got the strong message from her that something bad was just about to happen to me, because she's seen it before and knows what's coming. There was absolutely no misunderstanding in her look. The guy then jumped out of his car. I immediately locked my door. He saw me and didn't care. He advanced rapidly around his car and what really disturbed me was he was rolling his right hand shirt sleeve up and staring at me with the most menacing expression I have ever seen. In that instant I knew this was about to go further than him just ranting about me being a crap driver. I knew he was going to hurt me for real. I slammed the car into reverse, thank god no other cars were on the carriageway, and shot backwards just before he reached the front of my car. I shot back about 50 foot at 20 miles an hour, turned the wheel and raced past him, onto the dual carriageway, and away I went. I was absolutely petrified, but was praying that that was the end of it. I'd gotten away and by the look on my face he must have known he'd actually scared me. Again, I was wrong. To my utter horror, I glanced into the rearview mirror and he was back in his sports car and racing up the carriageway to catch up with me. My little car had no chance against his and he was gaining with every second. To make matters worse, the carriageway was about five miles long and a straight run towards the motorway I needed to get on. At regular intervals, there were strictly enforced speed cameras and traffic lights to slow down the flow. In one way, this saved me though, as both of us always slowed down to 60 miles per hour as we passed through each camera. The guy must have been local. As I was ahead, I always got back a precious few seconds as he had to slow down as he went by. By now, we were close to the motorway and I was all over the place mentally. I was shaking and sweating. I didn't know what to do. I thought about just pulling over and having it out with him, but that girl's face was so strong in my mind, my gut instinct told me that that was the worst thing to do. Who the fuck was this guy and why wouldn't he leave me alone? What was he going to do after making all this effort? I started to panic about getting on the motorway where there was even more of a lack of people than on the carriageway if he'd gotten hold of me somehow. We were approaching the final set of traffic lights before the motorway entrance. It was now or never. The road curved, so for a few seconds he lost sight of me. In that time I slammed on my brakes to slow down my speed and turned off the carriageway, onto a housing estate with a dead end. At about 1.45am in the morning, every house was in darkness. The street lamps were a pale yellow but didn't penetrate the dark very well. I literally drove down the cul-de-sac and pulled right onto some random person's house driveway and turned off all my lights. I got down onto the floor by the pedals and hid. I was shaking and panicking, not wanting the house owner to wake up, but also hoping they might as this was getting ridiculous and I was starting to wonder if the police shouldn't be informed. Nothing happened for about 30 seconds and then suddenly I saw two bright main beam lights circle the cul-de-sac slowly. I didn't lift my head up to check, but I knew it was him. Not one single car had I seen in 25 minutes and now this, it had to be him. The lights circled twice, slowly. I just sat and waited for the inevitable and was preparing to scream when he found me, but nothing happened. The street went dark again and I was still sitting whimpering by the pedals of my car. What seemed like years passed, but if it was two minutes I'm being generous. Before I scrambled out from under the steering wheel and back into my seat, I felt a bit better at this point and kind of laughed anxiously to myself that these little ruses that I'd seen in the movies sometimes worked. But seriously, I just wanted to get home and prayed that was it. I was wrong. 
I pulled back onto the carriageway and was pleased to see that the road was empty again. I got back up to 50 miles per hour and indicated out of habit to start to enter the entrance of the motorway when lights were picked up in my rearview mirror. At first I immediately discounted it. No way could it be him. No way. As the lights gained on me I saw the familiar shape of the Porsche, the blackened out windows, the grill. He was back. Now at this point is where panic really began to set in. This wasn't a catch me if you can routine any longer. This was going to be significant if he got hold of me. No one takes that amount of time and trouble late at night to call someone a shit driver. No one. And then there was that girl's face. I didn't read her wrong. These actions now proved to me that this had got to come to a head before it was over. I pulled onto the motorway, went into fifth gear and the chase was on. I pushed my poor old car up to just under 100 miles an hour. The speed limit was 70 on that stretch and I knew it. I prayed that the traffic police would see me on CCTV and send a car out, or someone would do something, but nothing happened. I'm going to be honest, I can't remember much of those six miles apart from being absolutely petrified. He stayed right behind me with his headlights right in my mirror as a reminder he was still right there. I kept trying to concentrate on the road ahead as I was driving so fast. The journey seemed to speed by. The fields and pastures turned industrial and I knew my exit was approaching. That's when it hit me. You are taking him to your house. What the fuck was I thinking? This guy had stalked me for about 14 miles and was showing no signs of stopping and I was quite merrily showing him the way to my identity in life. I pulled off the motorway at the last possible second without indicating, hoping he would miss the exit and give up. Nope, he made it. Lights shining the lot. Now it was a rerun of what happened on the carriageway. Both of us speeding along, trying to slow down for the speed cameras. However, I'd had enough at this point and started not slowing down and shooting red lights. As soon as I shot my first red light, so did he. Again, I realised this guy was serious and it wasn't going to stop until he felt he had got justice for me cutting him up. I was about two miles away from my house and still speeding along at this point, trying to think of something to do. Then I saw my local gas station looming up ahead of me. It is one of those 24-hour ones which are always manned. Most of the staff know me there as I go in pretty much every day, as there is a mini supermarket attached. I swerved onto the forecourt of the gas station without indicating again. I didn't even try to park my car, or secure my valuables. I skidded to a halt right outside the main doors, threw open my car door and ran inside shouting, There is a man following me, can you call the police? To my disbelief, the guy had also swung onto the forecourt, and had jumped out of his car. I thought, here we go, I'm going to have to fight him in here now and looked around for something to grab to use as a weapon. One of the assistants who knew me by face said, Who's following you? I screamed, Him! and pointed through the glass to the man starting to walk towards us with his sleeves rolled up. The cashier called the police immediately. She was standing in the window at her till, watching him as she did it, and he could see her. He abruptly turned on his heel and got back in his car. As the light illuminated the interior, I saw the girl in the passenger side one last time. Her head was in her hands and she was crouched over as if in extreme anxiety or pain. I presumed it was anxiety at that point. No way was she part of what happened. It must have been as frightening for her as it was for me. Naturally, the police didn't help much. It all seemed a bit far-fetched for them, I think. They said they would review the CCTV and get back to me, but I never heard anything. So crazy guy in your car on the carriageway in Birmingham. Let's not meet ever again. I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks wearing a leash. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago, but less common and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case, it was a necessity. I would always start wandering off from the rest of the family no matter what the situation. This is one of those stories that led me to earning my leash. It happened when I was about six years old. I went to the zoo with my mum and sisters. Before every family outing, my mum made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or I would have to face the consequences. My mum was a strict parent that made good on her promises. She had to be, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay attention to the world and people around me. 
It was no different this day. I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention and off I went. When I'd finally realised I'd separated myself from my mum and sisters, again, I panicked and started walking around the zoo looking for them, being afraid for my mum's reaction more than anything else. After a while I somehow got it in my head that if I could just walk out, find our car and wait there, my family would eventually find me. So that's what I did. I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighbourhood looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing looked familiar and I started crying. My mum was going to be so mad. Then this man came up to me. He was just normal looking, about 40 years old, asking me if I was lost. I explained I'd lost my family whilst we were visiting the zoo and I'm looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he had just come from the zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance who were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap. But it was still a few blocks away so he proposed I walk with him to his car and we could drive the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his car finally made me hesitant. I told him I wasn't allowed to get in the car with strangers. My mum would be so mad. He then said something like, That was true, but I look smart enough to know if I could trust someone. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like that. He added that he'd spoken to my parents earlier when they were looking for me, so he's not a complete stranger. That didn't seem right. I asked him if he really talked to my dad, who had died a year before, and when he said he did, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the situation I was in. I was just really confused about everything and scared of how angry my mum was going to be after all this. Finally my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking building we were standing next to and asked if there was something he could help with. The guy stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation but made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him, pointing us in the right direction towards the zoo. The man thanked the security guard and proceeds to take my hand to walk away. The security guard takes a last look at me and asks me, in a comforting, friendly, adult-to-child kind of way, why I'm still crying. I tell him that my dad is dead. He looks really confused for a few seconds, then asks if this man is not my dad. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. In a split second, his whole face and posture changes and he turns to look at the guy, who's trying to explain he never actually said he was my dad and that the security guard must have misunderstood him and that he was just helping me find my mum. The security guard said he appreciated the man's help, but he would take me off his hands now. The guy immediately took off. I don't think that there was much else the security guard could have done. I explained the whole situation and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the parking building. From there, we were brought to the security's office where my mum and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place at the right time, and very grateful for the extra second of time he took that could have made all the difference. I don't see much of a reason to preface this story, so here we go. It was the beginning of fall and my dad had little over a month off work because he just had a hernia surgery. I'm 19, but I'm currently unemployed and not in school, though I'm doing my best to work on remedying that. It's besides the point. Point is, I was free to come along and accompany him to a little over a week at the beach in North Carolina. We had been staying at the beach for a few days by this point and I had been spending most of my time in the indoor pool. Now, the place we stay at is directly on the shore, so all I'd have to do is step outside and walk down a ramp, and there was the ocean. The thing is, this beach wasn't far down from the local pier, so it's basically near a public access. This made it crowded, especially since there were some huge waves going on at the time we were there, so there was a decent surf crowd. I don't mind big crowds when I'm with friends or family, but my dad was fishing most of the time, and I am not a big fan of shore fishing when tons of people are around kids play in the water, people walk into your line or chase fish away. It's not fun. Plus, the seagulls can be a pain. So, basically, I just didn't go on the beach during the day. But at night, I was game. I loved walking along the beach just after the sunset, as there were barely any people. 
no feeling self-conscious or anxious or worrying about dealing with my anxiety much at all. Just me, the beach, and the occasional ghost crab I'd catch, take a picture of, and then let go. This particular night I was sad. I was worried about my friend and his well-being because of some personal things going on in his life, and I was scared he was going to get hurt, especially when almost the entirety of our group of friends was praising him for it and telling me I worry too much. Which perhaps I do, but I really care about his well-being and wasn't too pleased with having my fear shrugged off. So to get my mind off things, I walked further than I usually do. I decided I wanted to walk all the way down to the pier by myself, ignoring common sense, because at that point I had bigger issues to worry about. At least to me I did. It was barely light out enough to see without a flashlight, unless you were by the pier and the area surrounding it. The night just felt stranger than usual, and I was slightly on edge. It was hard to see people, and the beach was almost completely empty. Most of the time there are at least a dozen people walking up and down the shore at this time, since it was only about 10 or 11 p.m., but not that night. It was vacant from what I could see. Still, I kept walking. I'm not the tiniest of girls. I'm about 5'9 and weigh 170 pounds, so I honestly wasn't that worried. I'm a decent runner and I knew if there was any danger, I could scream to the workers who were no doubt closing the pier up for the night, since I'm pretty sure they close about 10, and even if not, there are plenty of beach houses lining that shore, and you can hear noises pretty easily. If all else failed, I'm a decent runner. Those thoughts became less and less comforting though, because as I walked, I looked to my right and noticed two hooded figures just sitting in the sand up by the dunes. They were almost invisible in the spot they were in, and I only noticed them because of their cigarettes. They wore black hoodies and long pants, and even what looked like shoes. I didn't flat out make it obvious I was staring at them. I had a hoodie on as well, so I just peeked at them from the corner of my eye to the best of my ability. I found it odd that people were wearing what either seemed to be tennis shoes or boots on a beach, knowing that sand would get in there. I shrugged it off and kept going, my mind going back to my friend in no time. I was getting closer to the pier when I stopped and decided to walk up the sand a bit as it was so pretty. I got up there to a higher vantage point to take in the view, when I noticed another figure under the pier. The pillars of the pier are tall and no one was around. The figure was facing in my direction and just standing there. He was dressed like the other guys, wearing a hoodie and seemingly wearing shoes. Now this was an even stranger spot to be wearing shoes in, since it was on wet sand edging the line that the tide was reaching and retreating from. It seemed like we just watched each other for a long moment, before he suddenly started sprinting towards me. Now I was close to the pier, but still a good distance away from being underneath it. Still, he was fast, and had cleared a few yards in seconds. I had frozen and was absolutely terrified. I just tensed up. I was about to turn to start running from this crazy dude, when out of nowhere he spun on his heel mid-sprint and ran back under the pier. He disappeared into the darkness, and I didn't see him. I didn't know if he was on drugs or some college HS kid thinking it would be funny to scare the living shit out of some random girl, but I wasn't sticking around to find out. I turned around and began quickly walking back towards where I was staying, looking over my shoulder every two seconds. I could have sworn I heard laughter but it may have just been in my head. I was further down the beach now and just about reaching the halfway point back to my place when I saw those same two guys from before, still in their spot, having not moved an inch. About 15 to 30 minutes had probably passed and I don't know if even their posture had changed. I had calmed down and was processing what had happened at the pier by this point, but seeing those two again didn't help my remaining unease. I just reminded myself that lots of people like the beach at night and there was nothing to worry about, so I kept walking. What really set me on edge again is when I had walked several yards past them back down the beach. I had got an anxious feeling and looked back and realised that they were trailing behind me about a yard back. The weirdest thing was, though, that when they realised I had stopped in my tracks and was watching them, they turned on their heels and walked the other way. It was mid-stride too, just like the runner. I have no explanation for this crazy-ass story. If the running guy knew the other two, if the running guy knew the other two, if it was just a random coincidence that I ran into three figures fully dressed for fucking winter on the beach with shoes on. Maybe they were all high off their asses, I don't know. 
All I know is that the only thing I got out of that experience is a somewhat interesting, if confusing, story and added caution when alone. Creepy, fully dressed men on the beach. Let's not meet again. <laughs>